Hello again and welcome to another Morning and Glory Warhammer 40k video. In today's episode, I want to take you through my beginner's guide to building an effective Imperial Guard Army list. I have three simple rules that I want to share with you that will help make your lists more effective on the battlefield and will hopefully point you in the right direction. Because when you look at the guard and you see how many data sheets there are available, just in the battle line alone, we've got all sorts of different infantry that all look very similar but do completely different things. It can be overwhelming. It can be very difficult to know where to start. So what I want this video to do is to help clear up some of the fog, hopefully get you started on the right path and get you building some lists that will allow you to achieve victory in the Emperor's name. And you know what? Let's not mess around. Let's just fix our bayonets and charge right into today's episode. Before we get into the nitty gritty, I just want to make something abundantly clear. I'm not going to be talking about specific units in this video. And there's two reasons for that. Firstly, I have done many, many videos going into the deep dive of each individual data sheet available to the guard. Literally every single one from the GW index to the two Forge World indexes. I've done individual videos on every single unit. And I've even done summary videos where I've talked about all units, whether smash or pass, good or bad. So if you want to find specific details, that's what those videos are for. Secondly, units come and go. Additions change, but I want this video to be something that will last through the ages, that will be good for several different editions, whether you're going back and playing old editions or new editions, maybe 11th, 12th edition comes out. I still want this video to be a valuable resource because I want it to be able to help people who are getting into the guard for many years to come. With that context given, there's just one big question. What makes a good guard list? What should you be putting into your army to make it effective on the tabletop and to stop you from losing every game, to help you actually start winning some games as well? Well, it's actually more simple than you might think. It doesn't require some 5D brain chess master to understand. Guard is great because of three things. Three golden rules, three types of units that if you achieve balance with, you'll do well. Infantry, tanks, and artillery. That might seem ridiculously simple, and in many ways it is, but let's now get into the nitty gritty. Do a bit of a deep dive on each one of those factors. Attention Guardsmen, the Commissariat has detected you have not yet liked this video. Do so immediately or else you will face the Empress wrath. And anyone who has not yet subscribed to the channel will be transferred to the penal battalions. That is all. Move out! First up, we have the Infantry Corps. Every day in the Corps is like a day on the farm. Every paycheck a fortune, every meal a banquet, every formation a parade. I love the Corps. Aliens quote aside, your infantry is one of the most important things. I often say that it always comes down to the infantryman and his rifle. You'll be surprised, but your infantry will probably score you the most points in game. Now, at the time of recording this video, we're talking about 10th edition. That may change depending on what edition you're playing. But whatever you are playing, your infantry will probably be the one that gets you the most victory points, whatever form that may take, whether they're primary points or secondary. Despite this, infantry is one of the things that I see consistently and constantly addition in and addition out that is overlooked by guard players. And it's easy to understand why a lot of people who play guard like tanks. They like the big metal boxes, they like the big boom boom, and tanks are often easier and quicker to build and paint. It's, it always amazes me whenever I build and paint an infantry squad, it can take me like a full week to do it, but I can get a tank knocked out in an afternoon. But let's come back to the tanks in a little moment. Their time will be soon. Let's focus on the infantry for a little bit. What makes it so important? Well, we've mentioned that it scores a lot of points. The reason it does this is your infantry wants to be up front. You want a lot of infantry because it needs to be pushing onto objectives. 
Infantry traditionally have had lots of different ways of being able to control objectives more effectively than other units. You've had things like objective secured, which meant that if infantry were on an objective, they held it and the enemy didn't. Doesn't matter if you only had one or two survivors on an objective, you held it. In things like 10th edition, infantry tend to be really OC intensive. This is where you might have literally three guardsmen on an objective and they're OC6. And that means that they actually hold that objective against something which is way, way more powerful and way more points intense than they are, such as a squad of like five Terminators. Sure, there's five Terminators on the objective, but they're only OC1 each. So their total OC is five. Your three guardsmen are outnumbered, they're outgunned, they're out everything, except their combined and total OC is six. So they hold the objective. One thing that separates the guard from other factions is how effective our battle line infantry can be with how OC intensive it is, as well as actually being able to do damage. Guard squads have access to a whole plethora of special weapons and heavy weapons. You've got melter guns, plasma guns, lance cannons, auto cannons, you name it, the guard infantry can pretty much wield it. And this really does separate us from a lot of factions who, like Marines, for example, where their basic infantry have basically got bolters or a bolt pistol and a chainsaw. Now, there are lots of factions out there which do have very effective infantry. For example, Death Guard and their Plague Marines can take oodles of special weapons and close combat weapons, but they are a lot more expensive. 10 Plague Marines will be the same points cost as 30 Guardsmen. And those 30 Guardsmen have got a lot more objective control and probably can match the Plague Marines in many ways for firepower with the amount of special weapons that they're bringing to the table. But there's one more aspect to the infantry which, above almost all else, makes them essential. Screening. If you're a veteran of this channel, you will now be able to fill out your bingo card because I go on about screening a lot but it is possibly the most important thing that infantry do and it's also the thing that makes them so damn important screening as a concept basically means you want a human shield you want a speed bump your infantry are going to go forward they're going to be in front of your army a lot of people put their infantry behind their tanks there's no actual benefit to doing that you don't get a cover save or anything like that so you want to put your inf well you might do it in future editions to be fair when you're watching this but you don't get a huge amount of benefit over the historically and currently for putting your infantry behind tanks so your infantry want to be at the front the reason for this is if your infantry are at the front and your infantry get contacted by like an assault unit and they get butchered i mean that's sad but you've lost a 110 120 point unit if your tank is up front and the enemy assault unit charges in and they destroy your tank you've lost a 200 point unit and you've lost a serious source of firepower it is a sad reality of the fact that infantry are expendable and their job is to die to buy time for the guns to do the work but screening isn't just about creating a, a wall of bodies to protect your firepower from close combat units screening also refers to the ability to push back enemy units that can deep strike or come in from reserve most of the time when a unit wants to come in from reserve they have to come in quite a way away, be it nine inches away if you're deep striking in 10th edition, for example. But if you have no infantry and someone's got a tank busting unit, maybe it's some Tau crisis suits, and they drop down from reserve and they can just see your valuable artillery piece, maybe a basilisk or your manticore, and they just blow it up, well, there's nothing you can do about that. Because you can't stop them from deep striking where they want it to go because you just didn't have any infantry. But if you've got some cheap infantry, they can spread out. And if you space them out two inches effectively and while staying in coherency, you'll be amazed at how much territory you can cover with just one or two big blobs of infantry. If you've got 20 or 30 guardsmen, and you just spread them out and you have it so that the enemy just can't deep strike anywhere important you are going to force your opponent to either keep his unit in reserve for an extra turn which is another turn of firepower that they're not bringing to the table or you're going to force them to bring him in somewhere he doesn't want to 
and then he's going to destroy a unit which isn't particularly valuable, which then means he's traded badly because inevitably, now your units will be able to move around the corner, come out from some landslide blocking terrain, see the enemy unit, which is possibly deep struck in a really bad place, and blow it off the table. So now that we understand the value that infantry bring to the table and how we should be using them, big question is, how many should we have? A good rule of thumb that has guided me over many editions has been 80 to 100. Now that might sound like a lot, and that might make a lot of new players go, oh, I don't want to paint that many guys. No, that's a nightmare. The good news is that you don't have to have exactly 80 to 100 infantry. There are a lot of things that can do the same role. They are pseudo infantry, if you will. For example, the 20 man infantry blob counts as 20 infantry. But what also counts as 20 infantry is 10 infantry inside a chimera. Because those infantry are very durable, they're bringing a lot of firepower thanks to that transport, and they're very fast so they can cover a large area. That's the equivalent of bringing 20 infantry. You've got a blob of Bulgrin, maybe you've got six Bulgrin. That is the equivalent of bringing 15, 20 infantry. If you've got a unit like Kazakin or Scions, a more elite unit, well, they can count as maybe one and a half infantry squads. What is is loads of different things you can use to fulfill the roles of infantry. I personally like taking my infantry units as, well, infantry squads or Cadians or something like that. You know, just normal blokes on foot. But if you're someone that doesn't want to or can't for whatever reason bring that many actual bodies to the table, instead of taking four blobs of infantry or five blobs of infantry, what you can take instead is three blobs of infantry, a unit of Bulgrin, and a unit of Sentinels. Or maybe you take a couple of blobs of infantry, and then you take a unit of Sentinels, an Armored Fist Squad, and some Bulgrin. Maybe you don't take many blobs of infantry at all. Maybe you go like one blob of infantry, one unit of infantry, and the rest of it is gonna be more elite, like Kazakin and other more specialist units. The point is, it's not necessarily about having a hundred bodies. It's about having four to five units that are the equivalent of taking 80 to 100 infantry, and they can do the same battlefield role. Primary objectives and screening. Now that just about wraps up the infantry side of things. Let's move on to our next aspect, which is tanks. Imperial Guard tanks are a really familiar sight on the battlefield and one of the number one draws to the faction. They're boxy and they're primitive, but they've always been a great source of firepower for the faction. And they are our principal damage dealers. Whether you're looking at the traditional Lehman Russ or something a little bit more newfangled and exotic, which is the Rogal Dawn which is kind of funny to think of as a new fangled unit because it's based on a very, very big tank. It's not a very complicated unit. But the point is, these armored beasts, these behemoths, have one really important job in your army, and that is to hurt the enemy. Take their toys and break them, to blow their units off the table, and to fundamentally just destroy your enemy's army. The reason why firepower and tanks is so important in the guard is it brings three things to the table. Firstly, Warhammer 40k is a war game and you will more often than not be rewarded for destroying enemy models. Whether that's directly rewarded because you have achieved a secondary or primary objective that involves destroying enemy unit or indirectly rewarded. Sometimes the easiest path to victory is to just break your enemy's army, to do so much damage to it that it no longer functions, where they've got no more troops, they've got no more firepower, or they've just got nothing left whatsoever. They just run out of tools in their toolbox and you can table your opponent, which means you take every model they have, you just blow them all off the table and that often will result in a victory for you. But in a more subtle way, Firepower not only is a great offensive tool, but it's a good defensive tool as well. The less models that your opponent has, the less guns they have, the less blades they have, the less damage output they have. And so the more of the enemy army that you destroy, the less damage output they have coming back at you. If you have a particularly lethal shooting phase, or over the course of a couple of turns, you're able to really browbeat your opponent's army, it 
can start creating a bit of a snowball effect where they have less and less damage coming towards you. As a result, you keep having your firepower maintain the same tempo, whereas they start having less and less and it begins to peter out. Finally, in a game where your firepower and your enemy's firepower may be evenly matched, or maybe you're even slightly outmatched in terms of the firefight, your tanks can provide an extremely important role as a distraction. That infantry squad that's running onto the objective and maybe planting the flag and getting you a few points might be winning you the game, but your opponent might be tunnel visioned, might be distracted by the big Rogel Dawn or Super Tank or even just a Lehman Russ rolling down a flank threatening one of his prize units. You might put your opponent in a bit of a rock and a hard place. Does he go after the infantry squad which is going to score points? Or does he go after the tank, which might take away one of his valuable units, giving him less options? Being a distraction unit can be very, very valuable, and it can be game winning because it can cause your opponent to make a mistake and mess up their target priority. And who cares if you lose 95% of your army if overall you end up winning on pure victory points? Like with the infantry, the big question here then is how many tanks should I be taking? I often say that three to five tank units is a good amount to have. Three being the absolute bare minimum and five being the maximum that I would recommend. If you start going too far into tanks, you might find that you're starting to cut points elsewhere in your list. You might have quite enough infantry to do all the screening that you want. And if you don't take enough vehicles, you might find yourself consistently outshot and out damage dealed in the wider game. As with the infantry, you don't just have to take tanks to do the same job as tanks. There are lots of pseudo tank like units. For example, you could take a Rogal Dawn and three Lehman Russes. That's four tank units. Very straightforward. You could swap one of those Lehman Russes out for a big block of elite infantry, something like Scions that can deep strike down and deliver some precision melter and plasma right into the heart of the enemy. It's also important to understand that you have some units which can blur the lines, do a couple of roles at the same time. For example, Sentinels. Sentinels are vehicles and they bring decent firepower, they've got LAS cannons, they've got hunter killer missiles, and overall they are pretty tough, especially when you're taking a lot of them. But they're also good at screening, they can move quickly, they can get onto objectives. So Sentinels can blur the lines a little bit and can provide you with a bit of extra tankiness, but also a bit of extra infantryness as well. Finally, we get to our last factor the artillery. This includes units such as your basilisks and your manticores, your field ordnance batteries with bombast cannons and your heavy weapon squads with mortars. Principally, their job is to reach out and do damage to the enemy. In this case, they're very similar to your tanks, but the big difference is how they do that damage and what they're going after. Artillery wants to take advantage of indirect fire where it can shoot at units it can't see. This allows you to not only do damage to the enemy whilst they can't shoot you back unless they've got their own indirect fire, but it also allows you to go after units that your opponent might not want to. 40k generally has a lot of terrain. It's pretty dense, and as a result, a lot of direct fire units like your tanks sometimes struggle to get the angles on the units that they want. If you rely solely on direct damage units, your opponent very well may just hide his whole army and play around you scoring the points that he can, and you spend the game getting very frustrated. By, pay by taking artillery, you don't allow your opponent to do that. If he decides to hide, you're going to bombard him. And so you often force your opponent to have a natural reaction of, well, no point in me hiding, so I might as well come out and fight. A bit of a catch 22 because now they're coming out and fighting. Guess what? Your damage dealing units are able to do stuff as well. It puts your opponent in a very difficult position and can prompt some instinctive reactions. On top of this, if your opponent has a little small unit, maybe it's got like five marines or five battle sisters or maybe ten fire warriors that are just hanging back and holding a backfield objective. 
Well, those units aren't very durable. If a tank was to roll up on them and blow them up, they'd do a lot of damage, but they're hiding behind some terrain, so you can't see them. You know what can see them? The artillery, because it can target what it can't see. By destroying those enemy units that your opponent has left behind, those garrison forces, those token squads, by destroying them, not only are you potentially denying him points, but you're also forcing him to redirect units back onto those objectives, which will weaken his offensive push into the middle of the board. Overall, I like to think of artillery as a disruptor, a problem maker, a headache giver to your opponent. Artillery doesn't always, although it can, be the primary source of damage. It doesn't always do a huge amount of damage to your opponent. But what it does is it throws spanners in the works. It throws wrenches into the wheels and it forces your opponent to maybe make decisions that they don't want to. Typically, artillery units will be artillery units. What I mean by that is you'll probably go for basilisks and antacorsal. But there are a couple of pseudo artillery options as well. Deep striking units and things that come in from reserve. Again, scions, you notice how scions can sort of cover a few different roles here. They can be an infantry unit. They can be a bit of a tank unit. They can also be a bit of an artillery unit because they can be what we like to call pseudo indirect fire. They might be able to deep strike behind a bit of terrain, behind where the enemy is hiding and hit that unit that the opponent thought was well hidden. Interestingly, combat units can also be pseudo artillery. Often combat units can charge units they can't see, they can sort of charge through walls and stuff like that. And so, this means that they can target things that you can't normally see. So having units like Bulgrins as well can be a very viable way of getting some indirect fire into your army, whilst at the same time maybe doing the same job as a bit of an infantry unit as well. As for how many of these indirect fire units, these artillery options you should be including, I say that most take all comers lists benefit from two to three of them. So if we put all of this together, our infantry, artillery, and our tanks, what we tend to find is that a good balanced take all comers guard list will have four or five infantry units, three to five tank units, and two to three artillery units. How I like to often describe this as you want a solid infantry core, you want a solid tank core, and then you want to season the entire thing with a bit of indirect fire and artillery. And if you do this, you'll have a well-balanced list with lots of tools in the toolbox. You'll go into games and you'll have everything you need to handle any situation that comes up. You come across an assault army, you've got the infantry to slow them down and the tanks to blow them up. Come across a sneaky army, well, you have got the artillery to force them out into the open. If you get into a direct firefight, well, you've got all three aspects. Your infantry with their special weapons, your tanks with their guns, and your artillery with their guns to try and win that engagement. Well, at least that's what I think. Of course, all of this is just like my opinion, man. Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. If you've got any questions, please get them down there and I'll do my best to answer them. And of course, if there's any other units that you're not sure about, whether you think it's a good choice or a bad choice, let me know and I'll do my best to point you in the right direction. If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to smash that like button. It really does help. And also subscribe to never miss an episode. Would you like to know more? If so, then please consider becoming a channel member or patron. By supporting the channel, not only will you be doing your part, but you'll also be helping me create more content for your viewing pleasure and unlocking a whole host of perks. You get everything from a badge next to your name, custom emojis, but the big one is access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost two and a half thousand active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got channels for army lists, hobbying, tactics, stories, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. For all you greenhorns that wanted to see the Mordian glory hole, today is your lucky day. And joking aside, I do want to say a massive thank you to all of the current 
channel members and patreons you guys are amazing truly the lifeblood of the channel i could not do more during glory full time without the incredible and generous support of my members so thank you guys so much and last but certainly not least i want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier patreons these are the War Masters, the people who have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty. To a heartfelt thank you to Alex Dengal, Bon Bon Vert, Mad Larkin, Marcus Roberts, Mark Panconi, RJ Scorpion, Swordfish Trombone, Try Again Bragg, John Stubbs, Nick Walsh, Diesel Fox, and August Barney. Seriously guys, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Your support is incredible and it makes a huge difference. Thank you so much. That's all for now. Hope you've all enjoyed today's video. And of course, as always, see you guys next time.